It was the end of the year 49 BCE, and the Roman Civil War was well underway. Julius Caesar had successfully pacified the Spanish provinces in a quick and impressive campaign, but this victory had been soured by losses elsewhere. At least three and a half legions had been destroyed in North Africa and Illyricum while he was gone. These defeats were humiliating, and Caesar couldn't afford any more losses like this. Pompey was in Greece, and from the looks of things, he was assembling a truly massive army. As it became obvious that Pompey was winning the recruitment game, the political winds began to shift. Many senators who had previously voiced their neutrality decided to openly side with Pompey. Cicero remained torn. In his opinion, when it came to an utter disregard for the law, Caesar and Pompey were two peas in a pod. Cicero privately confessed his fear that no matter who won the war, a military dictatorship seemed the likeliest outcome. After months of uncertainty, Cicero eventually convinced himself that if there was to be a military dictatorship, it would be better if it had the nominal support of the Senate. That way, whenever politics returned to normal, the Senate would be well positioned to pick up the pieces. Cicero reluctantly decided to join Pompey and the Senate in Greece. In Greece, Cicero met up with Domitius Ahenobarbus, who had recently arrived from Massilia after facing off against the Caesarians. Cicero and Domitius were very different kinds of politicians, but as they talked, it became clear that they agreed on quite a lot. Both men agreed that Pompey had become a lot more authoritarian since the beginning of the Civil War. It seems that Cicero's fears of a military dictatorship were entirely justified. Cicero and Domitius agreed to try to curb this behavior going forward. While Pompey and the Senate were continuing to gather strength in the east, Caesar returned to Rome, where he immediately faced a serious problem. Caesar didn't have the support of the Senate, so he needed every scrap of legitimacy he could find. Occupying the capital city had helped a lot in this regard, but now, basic Roman politics were starting to get in the way. See, by custom, that year's consuls were supposed to supervise the election of next year's consuls. The problem was, Rome's consuls were in Greece, with Pompey, making an election impossible. Without elections, it was hard for Caesar to argue that this was the legitimate Roman government. Caesar suggested that they let a lowly praetor supervise the elections, but this was an unprecedented request, and Rome's religious officials struck it down. Marcus Lepidus, one of the few remaining elected officials in Rome, suggested to the Senate, or what was left of it, that they name Caesar Dictator, an office created to temporarily give one individual full political power. This would allow Caesar to hold elections himself, without the need for the two incumbent consuls. There was barely any Senate to speak of, but those present went along with Lepidus' request. Without very much fuss, Caesar was named Dictator, and as Dictator, he got to personally oversee the elections. You'll never believe who won. Caesar, of all people, would serve as consul for the year 48, alongside one of his lackeys. Let's take a moment here and just remind ourselves that the root cause of the Civil War was a disagreement over whether or not Caesar should be allowed to stand for election. Now here he was, less than a year later, overseeing his own election as consul. It must have felt pretty good. Eleven days later, Caesar resigned as dictator. As consul, he would not need the dictatorial powers. Somewhere around this time, Caesar had the Senate pass a law that finally fulfilled his promise to grant Roman citizenship to the people of Cisalpine Gaul. This was a long time coming, and a very big deal. First off, Caesar's legions were disproportionately from Cisalpine Gaul and the surrounding area. As you can imagine, they loved the fact that their families and friends had all just been granted citizenship. Any concerns that Caesar had about the loyalty of his legions could be put to bed for the time being. Secondly, with the passage of this law, Caesar created a whole new voting bloc that was singularly loyal to him. 
he would have the power to swing elections for decades to come. With domestic politics under control, it was time to continue the Civil War. But there was a problem. Italy was under blockade. The land route through Illyricum passed through a mountain range, which was controlled by the Pompeians, so going that way wasn't really an option. Caesar needed to figure out how to break the blockade. There was another problem. Caesar had just enough ships to transport half of his army at a time. This meant that he didn't just need to break the blockade once, he had to break it three times. Greece, Italy, then Greece again. To make matters worse, Caesar's old enemy Bibulus was in charge of the blockade. There was no way this dude was going to back down. The Caesarians were just going to have to go for it. Caesar officially became consul on January 1st of the year 48. Three days later, he set sail. It had been almost exactly one year since he crossed the Rubicon. Bibulus was not prepared for a winter crossing, and for good reason. Winter crossings were extremely dangerous. At this point in the year, Bibulus had most of his ships safely in harbor. But Caesar knew something that Bibulus didn't. This wasn't a winter crossing. This was an autumn crossing. The Roman calendar drifted every year, and it was somebody's job to come along every once in a while and manually fix it. Whose job was this? The Pontifex Maximus. Who was the Pontifex Maximus? Julius Caesar. Why hadn't he fixed it? He'd been out of the country for a decade. At this point, the calendar was so broken that it said early January, but it felt more like early October. Bibulus was acting like it was January. Caesar was acting like it was October. It's dangerous to sail in October, but not impossible. Caesar took that risk. The first half of Caesar's army made the crossing without incident. By the time the empty ships were on their way back to Italy, Bibulus discovered what was going on and mobilized the fleet. Most of Caesar's ships were able to make it back just in time for Bibulus' blockade to snap shut behind them. This was not how it was supposed to go. Caesar was cut off. This could go really, really bad. Pompey was using the nearby city of Dyrrhachium as his main supply depot. Now that Caesar was cut off from Italy, he needed those supplies. Caesar took his tiny half-army and marched on the city. Pompey immediately responded and moved to intercept him. This was not the ideal time for a decisive confrontation. When Caesar heard that Pompey was coming, he withdrew to the south and found a good defensive position near a river. In time, Pompey's army showed up and encamped on the opposite side of the river. Pompey didn't want to attack a defensive position, and Caesar didn't want to give up a defensive position, so the two armies just stared at each other. Everybody knew that the stranded Caesarians would run out of food eventually. Their only hope was for the reinforcements from Italy to show up before that happened. The Caesarians in Italy made several attempts at a crossing, but were turned back every time. Ancient Roman ships were not really designed for long voyages, which meant that every two or three days, crews had to come ashore to gather food and water. Caesar began sending patrols up and down the coast, with orders to attack these crews on sight, hoping that this would put a strain on the blockade. It did. Before too long, Biblis sent his second-in-command to negotiate with Caesar. His terms were this. Please allow us to come ashore and resupply. Caesar was like, in exchange for what? Biblis' man was like, what? Caesar was like, what will you give me if I do that? Biblis' man was like, I'm not authorized to give you anything. Caesar was like, what do you think negotiations are? Biblis' man was like, what? Caesar was like, get out of here. And then Biblis dropped dead, entering the history books as the patron saint of idiotic politicians. I mean, I just made that up, but that should definitely be a thing. The Bibulus Award? Anybody? That one's a freebie. Weeks and then months passed, and still no reinforcements from Italy. The Caesarian half-army was stranded for the entire actual winter. In the actual spring, the ships finally slipped past the blockade and delivered the reinforcements. 
The Caesareans were still outnumbered, but at least now they stood a fighting chance. Of course, having the full Caesarean army in place didn't change the fact that they were still cut off with virtually no food. Caesar now attempted to goad Pompey into battle, but Pompey refused. He knew that Caesar's supply problem was only getting worse, and that the longer he waited, the stronger his hand would become. Caesar then surprised Pompey by abruptly marching away and making a beeline for the supply depot at Dyrrachium. The Caesareans encamped on a hill just outside the city, with the Pompeians hot on their heels. Caesar had the better position, but he was also in a bit of a bind. He needed to control the hill, and he also needed to seize the supply depot. If he attacked the city, the Pompeians would attack the hill. If he didn't attack the city, his army would starve. In fact, the situation was getting so bad that around this time the Caesareans were reduced to eating animal feed. So Caesar needed to somehow discourage the Pompeians from attacking the hill. He ordered his men to begin building a wall. Pompey was like, that's an amazing idea. His whole plan was to starve the Caesareans into submission, so he began building his own wall to prevent them from escaping. It was now a race. Whoever was faster at building a wall would be able to circle around the other army and block them in. Over the next days and weeks, both sides sent raids to disrupt the other's construction. In time, Caesar's wall stretched over 31 kilometers, while Pompey's was a little under 28. Caesar was winning the race, barely. Caesar's slight wall advantage allowed him to cut off Pompey's water supply. Now, even though Caesar's men were starving, Pompey was the one under time constraints. He began probing Caesar's walls, looking for weaknesses. Without warning, Pompey attacked a section of Caesar's wall with four or 5,000 men. There were only 700 Caesareans in the immediate area, and reinforcements were several kilometers away. These 700 Caesareans fought ferociously, and we are told that literally every one of them had sustained an injury by the time the reinforcements got there. Yet somehow, they held on to the wall. The Pompeians pulled back. As the days passed, the raids got more and more intense. Eventually, Pompey caught a break. Two Gauls from Caesar's army defected over to his side and outlined the weaknesses in Caesar's defenses. This was Pompey's chance. He launched a nighttime attack against the section of the wall near the coast, with 25 or 30,000 men. This time, the Pompeians broke through the wall, overwhelming the Caesareans and causing them to flee. Mark Antony brought up reinforcements and stopped the bleeding by setting up a secondary line of defense, but the damage was done, and the Pompeians had successfully captured an important section of the Caesarean Wall. These two lines of fortification had actually shifted a bunch over time, and Pompey used his victory as cover to seize one of Caesar's abandoned forts in No Man's Land. Caesar thought that this was a serious tactical mistake. This fort was far from the action, which would make it difficult to reinforce. He sent a group to attack the fort along a circuitous route so the Pompeians wouldn't see them coming. It worked. The Pompeians were oblivious until the moment the Caesareans attacked. They burst through the walls pretty easily, only to discover, rut row, the Pompeians had built a secondary set of walls inside the fort. Now the Caesareans were sandwiched between two sets of walls, and as the fighting intensified, things started going badly. Some of the Caesareans had the idea to circle around and attack the fort from the other side. They disengaged from the main battle and began looking for a door. However, in the heat of the battle, they got kinda turned around and found themselves following the 28-kilometer Pompeian wall away from the battle. By this time, the Pompeians were able to get their act together and counterattack. Now it was the Caesareans who found themselves isolated. The whole thing backfired. Pompey ordered his cavalry to circle around and attack the lost Caesareans. They broke and fled. The Caesareans back at the fort saw their men fleeing in the distance and assumed that the entire battle had been lost. They too panicked and tried to flee. 
However, these guys were still sandwiched between the two walls of the fort. There was a bottleneck, which caused pandemonium. Caesar tried to stop the rout, but he couldn't. Things got so desperate that one of his own men tried to kill him with a spear. Caesar's bodyguards were there and saved his life. In the aftermath of the Battle of Dyrrhachium, Labinus, Caesar's old second-in-command, who was now serving under Pompey, made a point of going to visit the Caesarian prisoners. He condemned his former brothers-in-arms as traitors to the Republic, and personally made sure that each and every one of them was put to death. Labinus was all in, apparently. Caesar had been defeated. He was out of food, out of options, and had no choice but to attempt to withdraw. He was surprised when Pompey didn't try to stop him. He told his advisors that the enemy would have won today if they were commanded by a winner. After their victory at Dyrrhachium, many of Pompey's advisors argued that they should take this opportunity to sail to Italy and retake Rome. Pompey disagreed, arguing that a withdrawal would make it look like he was afraid to fight Caesar, which is a weird thing to say after winning a battle, but whatever. Besides, Pompey argued, Caesar's army was weak and growing weaker. If he stayed, the decisive killing blow would come later this year. Patience. The opportunity for that decisive killing blow came one month later, near the city of Pharsalus. I made a thing entirely devoted to the Battle of Pharsalus, and I'll link to it at the end of this. But basically, here's what happened. Pompey deployed next to a river. The main attack would take place on his left, with Domitius Hannibarbus commanding the infantry and Labinus commanding the cavalry. Two capable commanders, each with experience fighting with or against Caesar. Pompey's plan was to let Caesar come to him, and then spring his trap. When the two armies clashed, Labinus led a cavalry charge on the left. Caesar had anticipated something like this, and had built up his infantry reserves on that side, including an extra line of spearmen hidden behind his lines. Labinus's cavalry charged right into the spearmen. The cavalry fell into a full rout, at which time Caesar pushed forward with all of his reserves. Domitius tried to hold the line, but the Pompeian cavalry was in full flight, and he was outnumbered. In time, his infantry also began to flee. Some say that Domitius died fighting, and others say that he was stabbed in the back as he was fleeing. After the fall of Pompey's left, the rest of the army didn't stand much of a chance. The center collapsed, and then the right, and then it was all over. Caesar was victorious. Cicero and Cato and a bunch of Rome's most prominent politicians were back at camp, waiting to hear how the battle went. When they got the news, they were devastated. Cato suggested making Cicero the new leader of the Pompeian faction. It made sense. As an ex-consul, Cicero was one of the highest ranking politicians present. Unlike Pompey, Cicero was politically savvy. And unlike Pompey, Cicero had a good-ish relationship with Caesar. When Cato and Cicero were having this discussion, were they thinking of a negotiated settlement? We don't know. This whole period contains a lot of interesting what-ifs, but this is my favorite. Cicero turned him down, saying that the civil war was essentially over, and that he intended to return to Rome and influence the peace. Remember Cicero's justification for joining the Pompeians in the first place. If there was going to be a military dictatorship, it would be better if it had the nominal support of the Senate. If Cicero returned to Rome, maybe he could make sure that the Senate retained its power. Cato didn't agree with Cicero's reasoning, but respected his decision. Cato decided to lead the Pompeians to North Africa, where they would continue the fight. The two men said their goodbyes. They would never see each other again. Pompey didn't go with the rest of the Pompeians. Instead, he boarded a ship and set sail for Egypt. The Egyptian pharaoh owed Pompey a massive favor, and maybe, if he was nice, that favor would come in the form of a shiny new army. Nearly two months later, 
Pompey arrived in Egypt. After a good deal of waiting around, he was granted an audience with the Egyptian pharaoh. A small boat came to pick him up. The crew greeted him in Latin, but when Pompey tried to make small talk, nobody responded, unsettling. When the boat hit the shore, Pompey stood up. The guy behind him stood up as well, drew his sword, and stabbed him in the back. There was a brief struggle, but Pompey fell, pulling his toga over his face with his last breath. The Romans considered this a dignified way to die. Pompey Magnus was dead. Many believed that the civil war was over. Caesar now wielded unrivaled political power, but it remained an open question what he would do with it. 